All right, hello everyone. We're gonna get started here. This is the event for this new book that's out by PM Press, Labor, Power, and Strategy, um, by John M Womack Jr., edited by Peter Olney, who we're joined by, and Glenn Peruzic. I assume I mispronounced that last name. Um, so, oh, good, thanks. Um, and there's a sign-up sheet going around in the audience um, for people who want more information about the book going forward. Um, and I know we're also joined on live stream, so thank you to everyone uh, who's watching from afar and avoided the very cold day in New York City. But extra points to everyone who's really here because that means a lot. Um, so to get started, I'm first gonna introduce one of our panelists who helped put this book together and who interviewed John for the bulk of the book. Um, and he'll explain how this book came together and also a little bit about John and what John's arguing in this book here um, and kind of the relevance right now for you know, a very critical moment in the US labor movement, which you can say at almost any point, but certainly is still true right now. Um, so Peter Olney is the retired director of organizing for the International Longshore and Warehouse Union. He was associate director of the University of California's Institute for Labor and Employment. He resides in San Francisco and teaches building trades union organizers as a member of the faculty of the Building Trades Academy at Michigan State University. He's also the editor of the Stanisbury Forum, and I'm sure there are many other things he's done, but I, that's enough for now. So Peter, go ahead. Good. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, thanks to the People's Forum for hosting this event. It's a real pleasure to be in New York with all this cold air. Anyways, uh, if you have not been obsessing on the uh, Chinese spy balloon, <laughs> it just got shot down. Okay. You may have watched the situation in France where there have been mass protests and strategic strikes against raising the pension age from 62 to 64. Strategic strikes specifically on the railroads, the high-speed rail, and on the metro in Paris. So that's real pertinent to the topic of discussion tonight, which is labor power and strategy. In my capacity as organizing director of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union on the West Coast, the union that represents the 29 ports from Vancouver, British Columbia to San Diego, I had the great and wonderful fortune of watching the exercise of working class power at strategic nodes in the supply chain. I'll tell you a quick story. In 2000, we organized a group of 140 workers in the port of Los Angeles at a coke and carbon exporting terminal called LAXT, LA Export. Uh, workers processed those products and then put them on a conveyor belt where they were taken to the water and then loaded by longshore workers onto ships for export, mainly to Japan for use in uh, uh, the steel industry. So we were 10 months into bargaining. The company had hired Jackson Lewis, uh, a firm that anyone in labor is well familiar with. Yeah, there we go. We, never fails to get the booze and business. <laughs> We hired Jackson Lewis, and they were surface bargaining, hoping to run the clock out and demoralize the workers and end up with the workers decertifying or throwing out the union. Well, 10 months in, we decided to strike them. We struck them, and within 24 hours, the whole terminal, export terminal, had come to a halt because our members stopped working to respect those picket lines. Uh, all commerce out of that terminal, whether it was their product or other products, were stopped. And within 48 hours, this attorney from Jackson Lewis, who had been lording it over me for 10 months, came to me and said, Peter, you got to get me something for my client. In other words, you got to give me something symbolic so that I can justify the thousands of dollars they spent on me and we have ended up agreeing to everything you had on the table. So these workers went from one section of the working class, their salaries doubled, to another section of the working class. That was an exercise of working class power in a very strategic position in the supply chain. I wrote an article in 2003 in New Labor Forum, the publication many of you are familiar with here in New York. Many of you have written for it. 
I wrote a piece called The Arithmetic of Decline and a Modest Proposal for Renewal. I talked about the decline in density in the labor movement, but I specifically said, we need to refocus on strategic industries in this country. And I mentioned manufacturing, and I mentioned the industry that I was working in, was, which is logistics. Soon after publishing this piece, I received an email from a Harvard professor named John Womack. And I recognized his name because I had read in the 70s his seminal work, Zapata and the Mexican Revolution, which is probably the most famous piece of writing in the English language about the Mexican Revolution. And I was thrilled and flattered that he was interested in talking to me. And he said, I saw your piece in New Labor Forum, and I want to send you this paper that I presented in Helsinki, Finland, uh, on the similar topic of strategic workers, strategic sectors, labor power. And I read the piece, and it's very technical, very interesting, very well researched. Again, one of those pieces where the footnotes kind of almost balance with the text, if you know what I mean. Uh, but very compelling and very good. And uh, so I decided, um, well, I should say one thing. This paper is now a book in Mexico called uh, Posición Estratégica y Fuerza Obrera. Strategic Position and Working Class Power. The book was translated by the Mexican government and is published in Mexico. Uh, Womack is a, a big name in Mexico, as you can imagine, and the Mexican government in 2009 gave him the Medalla de uh, 1808, which is a prize celebrating the anniversary of the early liberation struggles in Mexico. And Womack, to his great credit, said no. I refuse the prize, and I'm turning the money over to the elect Electrical Workers Union, which if you know the history of the Mexican Revolution, their strikes in, in 1916 were crucial to the Mexican Revolution happening. So this is a guy who not only talks the talk, he walks the walk. So I decided we better capture some of this wisdom in English, and I interviewed John Womack at a restaurant in Somerville, Massachusetts called The Foundry. So we call <laughs> these interviews The Foundry Interviews. Very misleading, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and basically, we got into wide-ranging discussion uh, of all kinds of things. What are, who are workers in the United States? What are strategic sectors? What's the experience of the Russian Revolution with strategic workers? What did John Dumla? have to say about strategic workers. And in fact, Womack draws a lot on some of Dunlop's work. Dunlop is not a fan of the left, not anybody that uh, anyone here would sing the praises of. He was Nixon's Secretary of Labor. But he had some very, he was one of those New Deal guys who had very incisive things to say about labor power. So you'll find in the interview, John covers a lot of turf and territory, um, and then, my colleague, Glenn Peroshek, is the way he Peroshek. pronounces it, Slovenian pronunciation, said to me, hey, the interview is great, but let's get 10 of labor's best educators and organizers to respond based on their practice. And so that's what the book is. The book is the interviews with John Womack, responses, and two of the respondents are here, Melissa Shetler and Jean Bruskin, responses to Womack. And, and then Womack responds to them, and then he, he, he writes an epilogue because the interviews happened in 2018. And as you know, in that four-year period, a lot has happened. So uh, I think uh, I'm almost finished, and we'll get to you know, the participation of the respondents. But I do want to read to you uh, just a paragraph from this book, which I think captures Womack's argument. He says, I want to argue hard that labor needs network analysis to see where its industrial and technical power is. It needs to know where the crucial industrial and technical connections are, the junctions, the intersections in space and time, to see how much workers in supply or transformation can interrupt, disrupt, where and when in their struggles they can stop the most capitalist 
expropriation of surplus value. That's his basic thrust. And this is not a new issue in labor or the left. You know, great organizers have always thought about choke points and weak points and how to unravel the seam of production. I'll never forget, I'll finish with this, I went to Teamster headquarters in D.C., the Marble Palace in 2005, and I was accompanied by the officers of our union, the president and the vice president, and we were to meet with Hoffa Jr. So the meeting unfolds in one of those giant conference rooms, some of you may have been in, and uh, Hoffa Jr. says, you know, my father was a great friend of Harry Bridges, the, the president of your union. And it's true that they had an interesting relationship. One was a red and one was a racketeer. But, <laughs> but they had an interesting relationship. And what Hoffa Jr. said, and this goes to Womack, he said, my father and your father used to spend time in the living room at our house on the floor with phone books moving them around and talking about where are the linkages, where are the vulnerabilities in the supply chain that we can export as union, exploit as unions. So this science of thinking strategically is not unique to the left, but it, damn well we better uh, take hold of it, grasp it, and use it uh, to go forward. So I'll stop there, Alex. Great, thank you so much, Peter. Um, so I'm going to give our two other respondents up here a proper introduction, and then we'll have a bit of a conversation about some of the things that are raised by Womack's somewhat polemical kind of argument for where labor should focus its limited resources. So Melissa uh, Shet Shetler, I'm sorry, Melissa Shetler works with the Climate Jobs National Resource Center and Cornell University's Labor Leading on Climate Initiative. She's a co-founder and form former executive director of Pathways to Apprenticeships, a pre-apprenticeship program that assists historically marginalized communities to gain access to union construction careers. She worked as a community organizer and member education facilitator facilitator with the Laborers Eastern Region Organizing Fund and became the director of organizing and later political director for the Metallic Lathers and Reinforcing Iron Workers Local 36. All of these people have very long and impressive bios, so I apologize. It's why I'm reading from my phone to make sure I don't forget things. Um, and our last participant, but not least, Jean Bruskin has been active for 40 years in the labor movement as local union president, organizer, and campaign coordinator for local and national unions. From 92 to 94, he served as labor deputy for Jesse Jackson's National Rainbow Coalition. He was secretary treasurer for the Food and Allied and Allied Services um, from 1996 to 2005. He was the UFCW campaign director for the Justice at Smithfield campaign in North Carolina, which we're gonna hear more about um, right now. And as he established the strategic campaigns department for the AFT 2009 to 2012. He also co-founded US Labor Against the War and has been active in other international labor solidarity efforts, including supporting independent union organizing. Um, so both Melissa and Jean, I first wanna ask, um, oh. <laughs> Of um, yes, I'm very glad to be with you in person. Um, it's an honor to talk to you tonight. Um, really impressive, kind of giants uh, on this panel. So I want to ask about, for both of you, what the key takeaways from Womack's kind of polemical analysis of the seams and the junctures and the strategic positions of workers. It's kind of argument for where labor should put its resources. When you read these interviews, what were your key takeaways? Melissa, let's start with you. Thank you, and thank you so much. Um, yeah, so my background uh, in labor has really been deeply steeped in the building trades, um, which is a unique position for a woman. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not that common, um, but becoming more common. Um, and before that, I came to it from a very different space in some ways, which was uh, as an educator, but particularly uh, interested in dialogic education and sort of Paolo Freire's way of thinking about people's experience and, and using that as learning and power. And so the book itself stood out to me because it was interviews and a dialogue. And first with Womack, and then with other folks, and then back with Womack again. 
and the modeling of the idea that we are not the experts of these things. And as organizers, which I've gone into many rooms as an organizer, I'm not the expert, right? It's the people doing the work. It's what do you do with your hands? It's what do you do with your feet? It's it's the, the embodied knowledge of work that is, to me, the PowerPoint. That's where we start. Um, so I thought a lot about that and sort of my responses to, his, to, to this book were really deeply sort of embedded in my ideas about how we change the way we educate organizers, right? Because that's my internal space. I've educated organizers. I've worked inside unions a lot. But I also have run a lot of strategic campaigns and worked in campaigns. And so the other thing that was both from Womack but also the respondents that was so as exciting was to be like, oh, we are on to something, right? And we do need to focus on these spaces of not only what are choke points internally uh, in construction. I, I look at concrete uh, as a great choke point. Um, and a lot of folks who have are in this room who I know from the building trades, we've stood on corners together and begged those concrete trucks to turn around. And those are some amazing choke point moments. Um, but in those campaigns, it also was really important that we were engaging the community, that we were engaging um, capital strategies and shutting down the money going to those spaces, that we were making sure we were blocking the, the permits. So, so that sort of broader vision as well, that it's great and vital and yet not enough, was kind of what I took away. Uh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> what I liked about this book <laughs> is that um, <clears throat> it, it is really like a polemic. You know, I mean, Womack is not a union organizer, <clears throat> but he's a, he has his, his own incredible experience, and he's a theoretician in a way. <clears throat> he has his uh, practical exposure, but <clears throat> he put this stuff out. <clears throat> and really, uh, the essays in there by, by the 10 of us Almost every one of us is sort of like, absolutely, yes, but. <laughs> so this is not a book of like, you know, John Womack, you know, uh, you know, thank you very much. This is a book of how do you deepen and make uh, and address the complexity of the difference between organizing a school bus driver and a longshoreman in an Amazon facility and a nurse or a nursing home, you know. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I really like the way it rolled out, and, and also uh, sort of the credit to the editors, all of our essays, the responding essays, are short. We're really like, you can read them in like 15 or 20 minutes, like four or five pages. Uh, and so there's a lot of sort of meat on the bone for people to argue about, not, not because read this book and then go take on your biggest target, you know, but <clears throat> because it's a polemic, just like Lenin stuff was a polemic, he, they're putting out some really hard ideas. And I have to say, although on one hand, the idea of identifying the choke points, say, in your facility or in your industry is sort of obvious, most of the time we don't do it. You know, people have a contract coming up. They, uh, they collect the, bar the proposals. They go to the table. Maybe they bring a lot of their members. Maybe they don't. They bargain. At some point, the boss says, eat shit. And then they try to get everybody to walk out. That's not what Womack is talking about, and that's not really the way you win. Uh, so <clears throat> I think this idea <clears throat> that in every single workplace, I don't care what it is, you can look at that workplace and figure out uh, either that industry or that workplace, where are the choke points? If these five people didn't show up tomorrow, would everything collapse? Oh, why don't we try that? That might be easier <laughs> than getting 300 people out who would send the message. There's no workplace that you can't do that. Uh, and uh, that's, I think, one of the advantages of what he's putting out there. Yeah, and Jean, just to follow up, I think as, you know, in speaking with you before this event, you were talking about the Smithfield campaign and how it seemed to really kind of carry out the strategy that Womack is advancing. And so can you tell up a little bit, for people who don't know the ins and outs of that campaign, can you talk about how you organize strategic workers and, and the whole process by which you end up winning? So the Justice <clears throat> Smithfield campaign was a Tar Hill, North Carolina packing plant of 5,000 workers, <clears throat> the biggest uh, pork slaughterhouse in the world by the biggest pork company in the world. <clears throat> um, and it was a... Uh, uh, the UFCW had tried twice 
in the 90s to run your basic straightforward union elections and the company I mean, we're not talking to ULPs. We're talking physically beating up organizers in front of the NLRB, turning out the lights, and having armed marshals at the door next to the supervisors. That's a ULP I ever saw. But it didn't matter. We won all of them, and they just kept being in courts. <clears throat> and then in 2006, I was asked to come in and create a campaign that would force them to the table. <clears throat> uh, so this was, you know, there's a lot to say about that. And there, by the way, there's an incredible film uh, somebody wants to talk to me about afterwards, but <clears throat> one of the turning points was that it, you know, the turnover was so great and the place was so huge. It's not like we could just, you know, say let's walk out. Although sometimes the Latino workers <laughs> led walkouts, but we were trying to figure out how do we hurt them in every way possible. And at one point, some of the uh, the workers in the livestock department. These are the people when the the plant. Uh, cuts and packages 32,000 hogs a day. And the livestock department are 90 workers in the two shifts whose job is when these insane 285 pigs come running off that truck after having been in a cage for eight months, uh, their job is to get, to get them through these gates and back eventually to the kill floor. It's not the greatest job. <clears throat> and so, but <clears throat> they came to us and said, you know, we're really pissed off. You know, we hate the job is bad enough. We get knocked down by these giant pigs and they just drag us off the ground. But there's nowhere for us to wash our hands. They don't have warm water or soap. And the only place we can drink, the spigot sticks out. And sometimes the pigs back up into the spigot where we're supposed to put our cup to get our water. And, we're, you know, we're really upset about that, you know. I said, I don't know what your problem is. No. So, <laughs> <coughs> so, so we used some of our good organizers inside there who started talking to everybody and doing a petition about, you know, we demand warm water to wash our hands, soap and clean drinking water. These are radical demands. <laughs> this is a $12 billion company. <laughs> Meanwhile, we, with the work, with a worker and an organizer, we started organize, w visiting every one of the workers we could find at home and having this conversation. Uh, and then the petition got ignored and on a given day, uh, you know, we had it all sort of decided. Uh, they signaled, okay, if you don't have this tomorrow, we're, we're sitting down. And they didn't. And then everybody sat down. And as soon as everybody sat down, all these trucks with thousands of hogs pulled up. And you try putting, if it's hard enough to get the hogs in the, in the uh, vehicle, you try getting them back in once they've come out. It's hard. It's really hard. <clears throat> And so, of course, if the hogs don't come in, the plant closes down. There's 5,000 workers. This was 90 of them, right? And the company just screaming and, and yelling and at the workers. And the workers are immediately on the phone with OSHA, right? Then they're calling our office. And we're calling all our supporters all over the country. And the company got so many phone calls, hundreds of phone calls, shut down their entire phone system. Reverend William Barber and other preachers in North Carolina show up outside the gate praying for water. God bless the company. May they please provide clean water for the, you know, uh, you know, and the press is there, oh, praying for water. What's going on here? <laughs> and uh, they gave in after all the threats. Within 48 hours, they had built an actual building inside of the building for them to be able to sit, put a microwave in there, warm water, all the stuff. And the whole plant knew about it. And then after that, the workers marched on several occasions during the lunchtime in front of a cafeteria of maybe a thousand or more people in their shirts and saying, here's what we did. Why don't you do it? And then other people started doing that. And uh, I just think without a strike, we still crushed them and we kept crushing them again until they gave in. So as has kind of been alluded to here, this is a very different idea than, say, another one of the respondents writing, Jane McAlevey. Um, so Jane's in the book, Responding to Womack. And one thing Jane has written quite a bit about, Jane, longtime union organizer and also author of many books about organizing, um, is to build towards 100% participation in a strike, you know, as a goal. That's how you win. This is not what Womack is saying, this is not what your story is demonstrating, mm -hmm. right? So that's one of the tensions. And I want to say, you know, and part of Jane's response, and several other respondents also speak to this, is 
you know, Womack is not saying it's just logistics or manufacturing workers who are strategic. He talks about IT workers. He talks about engineers. He talks about security guards and cafeteria workers on, say, tech campuses. But he doesn't really think of, say, nurses or teachers as strategically located, right? Though in the interviews, he praises especially the West Virginia teachers' strike. Um, and so there's a bit of a contradiction or kind of question begged of, you know, organizers often look to who's in motion right now, right? This is part of the equation is we've seen that teachers and nurses over the pandemic are really kind of actively organizing, not evenly, but certain unions, of course, are really leading the way, whether the Chicago Teachers Union or nurses who struck during the pandemic. And so I'm curious what any of or all of you make of this question of kind of focusing on that, on these, on the strategic position, kind of privileging that over who's actually in motion and kind of kind of located associationally um, in a very powerful place, right, mm. that actually we've seen can really kind of catalyze a whole community around broader demands than just a contract, right? I mean, teachers talking about children's education um, conditions and vice versa with the same thing with nurses and patients' conditions. So any of you who wants to speak to that? Well, I'll jump in on this one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One of the respondents is a very talented uh, academic in Britain named Katie Fox Hodes, who teaches at Sheffield. She was an organizer who worked for me on, in the ILWU, but she's gone on to much bigger and better things. I guess this mic is an on, or is it? I'm not speaking loud enough. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Katie Fox Hodes is one of the respondents. She teaches at Sheffield in England. She worked for me at the ILWU as an organizer. Uh, one of the points she makes is, uh, and this is a partial response, Alex, is that even in positions of tremendous power, if the working class does not develop associational power, which she, she means broader socio-political support for those workers, then because of that power that they can exercise, the state will come down on them and if they haven't built that kind of associational force and power, they're gonna be crushed. And that resonated for me because I know our dock workers in Oakland can step out and close the docks over a political issue or be picketed by Occupy and close the docks. But if similar workers at a similar position in the supply chain in Singapore did that, they'd probably be shot or the army would come in and displace them. So I think that's a very profound point. I think John underestimates that. He comes back always to say that it's a derivative. Associational power is a derivative of structural power. And I just, I think Katie makes a compelling argument for the importance of associational power. You want to say something? Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I think further in terms of what uh, Jane talked about in her chapter uh, is she talked about nurses and teachers and she said well first of all these are women workers uh, and uh, and that's a really important concept to understand the way women exercise power in this country and that when you shut down a city with a teacher strike <clears throat> or you sh the kind of thing that just happened in Minneapolis when they had 15,000 nurses on uh, from e almost every hospital. <clears throat> that has a huge economic and structural Im impact on that community. We're talking industries that have big, extensive amounts of money. And when you strike as a nurse and, and shut the hospital down and the community supports you, that's power. You know, I started out as a school bus driver in Boston during desegregation busing. We had a whole series of strikes. And when we struck, we always struck in support of safety for the children and, and bus monitors. And uh, we had the parents supporting us when they couldn't take care of their kids, like happened at CTU in Chicago when the teachers went out. That's a whole other way to build what, what uh, Womack understands as associate power. but just because those workers aren't in the, uh, the big industrial plants doesn't mean that we ignore them. That's, we develop the power wherever people are ready to move. And I think that sort of comes out in the book. Yeah, right. well, I would, I disagree um, in the ways that she talks about the ways that sort of 
these industries organize that are predominantly run by women and sort of that they use that power to push more social, not just kind of contracts, but like broader right. social pieces. Right. Um, and also when you're, but even when you're creating those campaigns, um, I remember the teachers in, in West Virginia talked about that they were really mindful of the impact on the community and were really careful ahead of time to go into the community and talk about how are we going to make sure that lunches are provided, how are we going to do this work together so that you can then support us in, in these demands that we need to make. And so um, it's a really thoughtful campaign. For, you know, you can't just assume that folks are going to be on your side even if it's because you're teaching their kids, right? Yeah. Can I sure. can I just add one more thing? Because I th I think it's important to recognize, however, that a lot of the work that Jane has done, and I'm a big fan of her work, has been in organized sectors yeah. where workers already have a union, where 100 percent is 100 percent. You can get there because you already have organization. It may be weak, it may be uh, a little petrified, and you need to revitalize it, but it's there. When you're talking about, and we have some Amazon workers here tonight, I hope they jump in if we open it up. When you're talking about a massive, say, fulfillment center at Amazon with 6,000 unorganized workers where the churn is immense, is it possible to get to 100%, even utilizing Jane's excellent methods? I would argue probably not. And we need to think about who are the strategic workers in some of those facilities that could be organized. Uh, water spiders are, are workers that supply the stowers and pickers inside these giant fulfillment centers. Are they the ones that could play the role of the cutters in the garment industry? You know, I don't know if people know this, but a lot of the garment industry was organized not necessarily by 100%, but by the cutters shutting down and being irreplaceable. So I think we, Jane is right about some of this, but She's also talking about a very different circumstance than the mass organization of unorganized workers. Yeah, um, and opening up, we'll do that in about 10 minutes because we obviously, this is a collaborative book and we want a conversation in the room as well. Um, but I'll just ask maybe one or two more questions of the panelists. Um, so, you know, taking Womack's analysis seriously, looking at who the people kind of deemed from his view strategically located, you know, all well and good, sure. Say we all agree with that. Easier said than done to actually organize those workers, right? I mean, Peter, in, in your first part of this book, you talk about how you tried to get the ILWU to take seriously the march in land, right? Starting to organize workers and along the supply chain internally in the United States, whether warehouse workers, manufacturing workers, not just dock workers. Didn't really happen, is what you say, I mean, to say the least. Um, and <laughs> there's a great contribution, I especially timely one, from Carrie Dahl in the book, who works for the uh, one of the rail unions um, and had organized internally there for a long time. And he similarly says, yeah, for sure, you know, these are strategically located workers that are in the rail unions. Um, and yet we have three a number of obstacles to ever doing what Womack is saying, right? He says there's the workers themselves as far as where they're located socially and even geographically. There's the lack of kind of a more class-wide perspective or radical perspective among the membership that, you know, the left is very small inside this union. And so to get workers to sort of think beyond sectional interests is a huge problem. And I mean, this is someone who's really been doing this work for a long time. Um, and, you know, it made me think of, you know, I mean, the rail strike that just wasn't um, of, you know, recently in the United States. Um, and so I'm just curious, especially, you know, all of you have experience in these sectors that John is sort of pointing to. And so what is the, what do you think of, I think, Carrie's response, Carrie Dahl's response and others who say, as Jean said, yes, but, and the but is a big one in yeah. this case. Yeah. <coughs> so Carrie uh, worked for the Brotherhood uh, Maintenance Away employees, which these are the guys that do the tracks. They lay the tracks all over the country. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and gals. And gals, yeah. Unfortunately, there should be more gals. I think most women don't know they can apply and actually get this job, but <coughs> some do and they make a difference. Um, so Peter and I started working with them when they called us at one point and, they, and the president said, gee, you know, uh, um, we wonder, you know, like we're worried that uh, this was a this was a number of years back that the Republicans and they could worry again, we're going to take over Congress and the presidency and take the railway labor clause that gives us a right to 
a closed shop out and we'd be screwed because we haven't talked to our members in years. <laughs> and we don't really know how to do that, but we were told that by somebody that you guys know how to do that kind of thing, <laughs> which is like, okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so when Peter and I came in, uh, we, the first thing we did was say, well, where does everybody work? You know, like where are the workplaces? That's the logical, you know, to map them out. They say, well, it sort of depends. You could be in Kansas City and you get assigned to a work gang in Montana and, and then the next week you're assigned to a work gang in Las Vegas and it's a different group of people and so on. <clears throat> so Carrie came in and over the course of a few years, Carrie came out of the ILWU, studied with this man who most organizers, it turns out, have at some point or another. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and so what Carrie did was develop a, a, uh, a, a internal organizing membership training and mobilization structure to uh, train the rank and file to be able to talk to each other and to be able to communicate and to be able to be active on the job uh, and started having meetings and started doing campaigning around the contract and the other unions and there's about 10 of them uh, were screaming and yelling at our at the BMWE president because their members started going to his uh, trainings and they're saying what the hell are you doing having our members come to your meetings and he says well i can't really tell your members what to do can i i mean you know <clears throat> but the point is that simply because they have incredible logistical power which almost played out recently but one of the reasons it didn't play out is they didn't do what carrie did and they didn't have the power of the membership ready to be exercised. And absent doing that, it doesn't matter what choke point you have control over. But if we get that, and they're calling up the ILWU and the UPS workers are involved, then anything is possible. And that's sort of what he's uh, provoking in this. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I worked with a model of Carrie's work also, because Peter and I ran some internal organizing uh, program rollout in uh, the iron workers where I worked um, and so we used a similar model and when you think about it like uh, the building trades these iron workers they're on different jobs all over the city throughout Westchester and Long Island all the time they often don't see each other either right so the union sort of sense of solidarity in that way and you know not very many people came to the union meetings and it was sort of a service like what have you got for me model of where's my union um, and so we used a lot of the same kind of techniques I think to get folks to start talking to each other to become their own organizers to raise issues through surveys which I would say I certainly cared less about what the surveys said so much as what who was doing them so it wasn't a survey you could email you had to stand and talk to someone right so it's like organizing 101 having one-on-ones but through the process sort of un un unearthed a bunch of things that were really valuable, like our shop stewards aren't doing their jobs and this is really awful and you know we're getting pushed really hard and it's pretty rough. And the lathers, if you don't know, they're metallic reinforcing iron workers, they put the rebar in, it's very, very heavy and exhausting work and they're getting pushed really hard. And so they started to show up to the union meetings and then they started to raise questions and then they started to push really hard. So, you know, it, it built some power. Um, I will say, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a sad ending a little bit to some of this, however, which is like we were part of a broader multi-campaign, um, multi-campaign campaign, which folks here were on and probably could say more about um, at Hudson Yards. And we did really strategic analysis. The Lathers had good relationships with the Teamsters. That means the concrete would stop, right? If someone else had put up a picket line, they might not have. So you had to do real like who respects who and who cares about who and threw up that line and had things going really well. And when the line had to come down and the next line came up, everybody was ready. And unfortunately, the international came in and said, no, actually, you have to go to work. And so. It was like we did everything here, but like this is, and here's globalism, right? And it's like other, it just keeps going out and out. Um, so, so that comes up. And, and I think some of the critique in the book that's been coming to us really usefully too is like, this is great. What about like the rest of the world and like the choke points in globalism? So. I'm, I'm good. 
All right, great. I think let's open it up to the audience. So we have someone, Gene, has a mic that he'll pass around. And if you could just, before you ask a question or share a story, just say, you know, if you're in a, in a union and what kind of your name, um, so we know who we're hearing from. So sh surely there are questions on this. Yep, in the back. In the back. Any comments? And we we want to we want to emphasize the interrogative instead of the declarative. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the is this working? <laughs> the dialogue. Is this working? Right, go ahead, try to. Is it working? Yep. Yeah. It is. Okay. Yep. Oh, it's not. I don't think it is. Actually. You can take mine. Go ahead. It's working. Yeah. There yeah, that's good. Go. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation and. And thank you. And I'm, uh, I spoke to Peter uh, last year about architecture organizing, so it's great to see you in person. Um, oh, I'm, by the way, I'm Sean Esrafili. Um, I'm also f on, uh, right now, I work with Department of Buildings. I'm local 211. Ah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I work with in you know, a public sector. But before that, I was also organizer for architects uh, in New York. And we had it, you know, we failed in one campaign, but we had a success. That's a longer story. <laughs> but um, so my question is that um, you, you, you know, you talked about the, the 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 organizing and like how the global impact of it. Um, and um, I know you, I don't know if you wa saw the Yanis speech in Cuba, which was about non-alignment movement. And what is your like? What is your formulating thought about that? Is this like somehow we have to sort of connect this to a party, and because we don't really have a workers' party right now in the U.S., you know, like we, we have to have some type of a global, you know, international connection <coughs> with all this like non-alignment movement. We don't really have a real representation. If we want it, like if the Yanis was ask Americans to like have a representation, who are we going to introduce? You know. And are you talking about the, uh, being part of the global movement, or are you talking about the parties here in the United States? Or well, well, let's say you want to, you know, you, you're saying that there's a impact of, like, for example, Singapore dock workers going on strike versus, you know, and that's important. It's important also to be able to connect with the workers there, but we don't really have a real connection in states with the other workers, you know throughout the world. I mean, we don't barely have a, any connection okay. with the rest of the country, okay. like from state to state. <coughs> I think that's uh, really critical. And uh, again, Can you restate his yeah, I, I tell me, I, I think if you're, if I'm restating it right, which is, you know, essentially you're saying that there's, this is a whole global economy here and we need to be connected to workers in other parts of the world to really exercise this power. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> and, um, it, you know, again, I think that we probably could use a little bit more in this book on that. Uh, certainly, we see that with Amazon. Uh, in my experience in Smithfield, we found out that they were all over Europe. Uh, and one of the first things uh, I did after I came on was we had some Smithfield plants that were already organized, and it turns out Smithfield was in France. They were in Poland. They were in a few other countries. So we created a video about conditions in Tar Heel, you know, the, the democratic freedom capital of the world, the United States. And we sent it, we, we translated it into Polish and these other languages. We sent it to these places, and these workers are going out of their mind. They can't even believe that anybody could be treated like that, you know. Uh, and so uh, we. We picked a single day or a couple days, uh, and we we sort of got everybody in all the Smithfield plants here and all the Smithfield plants in Europe uh, to act in unity in a single day. Whether it was putting on a sticker, handing out a leaflet, uh, and turned out in France, one some one of the groups walked out, <coughs> um, <coughs> and it sort of began <coughs> that perspective in the campaign. <coughs> Again. <coughs> And this is, a, this is what the challenge for all of our, and, and most of our national and international unions. The USCW uh, 
allowed that to happen, but they weren't really comfortable with that kind of aggressive strategy. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, when we got on the phone afterwards to debrief with all the local presidents from the U.S. and around the world, and we were talking about, uh, well, what next? And the Smithfield locals were trying to figure out if they could do the stickers again and so on. You know, they, they want to get the employer mad. And some French leader gets on, well, it's just, I was thinking maybe let's all strike next month, you know? <laughs> and then everybody said, so there's a real value to that in terms of what it teaches us, but it's also a challenge for us to educate both our own members and our own unions that we cannot win the way the global economy is set up unless we understand uh, the way it works. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Christopher Smith. My pronoun is him. Uh, I live in the Bronx. I'm right here in New York, and I live in the Bronx. So last year, I supported a New Year strike, and like what you mentioned about the uh, about the stop of Union strike, all around the five five balls. So. So, eh, so the thing is that, like, uh, 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 like I really don't work in in, in Starbucks because I, I go to Starbucks to get coffee, and, and they, every, uh, the time I start uh, st uh, when uh, when I start start work, go to work, I every time I go to work I go to Starbucks to get coffee because the Starbucks is 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 right next to next next to my job, so. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I want to thank you. I want to so thank you for thank you, thank you for allowing me for for the book. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I? Oh, sure. I think we're talking about Starbucks. Oh. This was a topic that's come up a lot in these forums that we had in Boston. Was what about Starbucks? What's the importance of that? Is that a strategic industry? Why should we care? And um, I'm wearing the button right here. <laughs> and the reason we should care, we had some very good answers to that in Boston, was we should care on a number of levels. One is that it's uh, young people in motion, for the most part, who will carry on this consciousness wherever they go, even if this is a transitory job. But it's also an example of taking on a major corporation nationwide uh, in multiple markets, uh, how, are you, how are you gonna win? What's your strategy for winning with, with Starbucks? And there's a lot of debate around that. So I think Starbucks is crucial to the future of labor, and I think it's something worth supporting and debating in terms of how are we gonna win at Starbucks. Thank you. Ooh, I always get uh, nervous hearing myself on the mic. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm Ira, I'm an Amazon worker, and I wanna hear you speak a little bit more about that relationship between like structural and associational power. And Gene, you, you tell this story about the 90 workers inside the plant, inside the slaughterhouse, who were able to exercise structural power, but you know, you can, there's one reading where like that structural power, it's like we sort of build out the backbone of the labor movement. But then the task is you know, to flesh it out, to fill it in. And we don't just want to stick with building out the backbone. And you tell the story of how you know, then they went through the rest of the plant, and they sort of advertised their actions. And also like stopping that production at that choke point had ripple effects. So it's like everybody has to become conscious of the, within the plant that they took action. And then they take the initiative to go spread the, you know, spread the good news and bring more people into the struggle. But a lot of times that's not how it plays out, which Peter, you talk about with the ports and their refusal for like the March Inland. Um, and in the US, it, it seems like labor law is specifically designed to prevent that type of solidarity between sectors, between companies within the same sector. Right. And my warehouse is a perfect example because inside the warehouse is a choke point, right? There's there's maybe 350 workers who 
touch every package that has to be delivered to most of Queens and a lot of North Brooklyn. And then those get sent out to say 800 drivers. And so inside is, is a pretty important choke point. But legally, we can't even strike with these drivers because they all belong to say 10 different micro companies that are subject to different sets of labor law, are prohibited from striking in solidarity with us anyway. Um, so that, that sort of like notion of, of spinning structural power into this broader associational power to kind of kind of grow this, this little vanguard into a mass movement, how do you cope with the fact that US labor law is very specifically designed to prevent this kind of thing from happening? Well, first of all, it's, uh, if you're talking about secondary strikes, which I think is what you're referring to, uh, which are prohibited under the National Labor Relations Act. Even, like, they wouldn't even recognize us as part of the same bargaining. Right. 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 Interestingly enough, under the Railway <coughs> Labor Act, you can have secondary strikes. Um, but what I would say to this is, one, it's important to remember that you're in a non-union situation. So in some ways, you're unencumbered by certain prohibitions and can engage in concerted protected action, uh, can coordinate a metro <coughs> strategy that would involve multiple delivery stations stopping work, which seems to me, and I'll defer to you because you're there, that if we did that in the New York area, we would have a tremendous power over Amazon, because it couldn't make deliveries to that final mile. So yes, the, the labor law handcuffs us. We're going to need labor law reform. There'll be a relationship between these struggles and, and movements and successful labor law reform, but we got to do that for the reasons you suggest. Yeah, I think that, that uh, <clears throat> people don't understand what, what, what is being said there, which is that all these drivers are contracted out. They're not employees. I don't think they're even employees of the companies that they are contracted from, right? They're my contracted from contracts or whatever. <clears throat> so it wouldn't matter if everybody wanted to sign a card tomorrow. They couldn't join a union. <clears throat> they could act collectively, but the obstacles are enormous in that kind of a, a situation. So you just have to figure out other ways to exercise structural power, really. That's not going to work for the most part in Amazon. But you know, I would say you know, what Peter's talking about and what people have talked about in, a, in Amazon in a number of different cities is this whole issue, uh, which I know you guys have been a part of conversations like, what if uh, uh, with this whole strategy of the delivery centers themselves being choke points and of all the delivery centers tomorrow uh, were shut down, even for an hour in New York City, then God knows how many millions of packages wouldn't go out, you know? And that would all of a sudden uh, potentially change the relationship, even between Amazon and, it, and, it, and these workers, because uh, you're looking at markets, and how, Amazon is not a com company, I don't care if you guys went out on a hunger strike for 11 years, right? It's this one facility. And even at I A L ALU in Staten Island, it's still one facility. It's a big one. But this is something where I figure, think we have to really think about markets. Uh, and Amazon cares about the New York market and the LA market, the Chicago market, because it, it, there's a lot of money there. And how do we impact that market? Is it, I think Wilmac would try to figure that out. And would the Teamsters cooperate and would some of the other uh, elements cooperate in that chain? You know, that would be my thought, yeah. Can we have a <clears throat> yeah, my name's uh, Freddie from Local 79, Labor's Un International Union North America. Um, I'm very, uh, sorry, can you hear me? Is it better? All yeah. right, so I'm very partial towards, like, I have never read this book. I don't know who Womack is, but I'm very partial towards uh, this idea suggestion of an industrial organization, like industrial basis of unionizing, as opposed to like business unionism or uh, so even social justice unionism, et cetera. But I, I, I see 
from my perspective, generally certain flaws in this uh, context. Um, you know, one being like we haven't had really militant industrial union basis of organizing for decades in this country as a labor movement. So absent that, contextually, the working class in this country are class consciously like more sort of like see unions as like service model organizations. Um, so they don't really even see them as worker organizations, even amongst themselves. So um, you have this sort of attitude where you have, as Melissa pointed out before, like, you know, like there are people like, oh, well, the union should get me a job. Even non-union workers, when you talk to them about unions, they're like, oh, well, can you get me into a union as opposed to organizing a union, right? right. Um, so that's a, that's a huge issue. And I mean, that definitely goes towards the aspect of like, sort of like, where we're at in terms of the model of organization and control by the state of unions, uh, because basically legally, they're legally the state structure has created unions into that model through the NLRB and through uh, you know the Taft Hartley Act. Um, so that that's the first thing. It's like the class consciousness seems to be just not there in a general sort of way, even with union approval being very high. This is how people see unions. Uh, the second thing I just wanted to pitch is like even when we get to that point of like, oh, where can we hit industrially centers, there's there's still a concern of what like, um, like I, I would think of like sort of addressing sort of like what Elaine Badu calls the nomadic proletariat, where just like sort of like, not just the industrial proletariat, but people that could take their jobs if they're on strike, right? Like, I mean, those people are, are abundant, right? So I mean, it'll see, say if you get a concrete guy to walk off the job, there's going to be somebody to replace that concrete guy. Um, and then, you know, like in that context, we should probably even consider not just like necessarily just the point of organization of production, but actually the sort of surrounding of that production, right? Like sort of like, I mean, in order to get the concrete there, you gotta go through a road, you have to go through a highway, et cetera, et cetera. I think like the uh, Keystone Pipeline uh, struggle showed and demonstrated that you could stop production, not even, you know, I mean, not stop it completely, but you could begin slowing it down through concerted, like sort of like more mass activity of uh, bringing people uh, forward, um, and then I just I will just say the third thing of my concern is that even amongst the organized labor force, we have a general disunity of labor, a lack of solidarity. People constantly will juridically approach um, like um, your scope of work. So, like you guys were talking about before, like. Um, uh, the the uh, the railroads uh, strike that almost occurred. I mean, there was four unions that voted yes. There was like a lot of the unions were were halfway there, but even then there was like there was no unity. There there was no active movement forward from that. There was no wildcat activity. I mean, maybe you want maybe there's something I you guys know that I don't know about, but that kind of just went pff, sunk sunk downward. But in the end, socialist politicians voting against the strike, right? So. Um, that's a huge issue. Um, like ultimately, like my sort of perspective is like, we, sh we should have, you know, like as a New Yorker, I wish that we had transit worker union strike in 2005 now. That would have been probably the more appropriate moment. Because at some point you have to, like as a real labor leader, Roger Toussaint, you know, like God bless him because he broke the law. He showed really what that, like that potential of what you guys are talking about was. But also even in that context, right, the political situation wasn't there for that strike to really like just, work out. Just for so, the time here. Yeah, do you want I'm to done. Answer? That's yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot there. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Uh, it's all right. Anybody want to comment or should I take another question? How do you want to? Why don't we take one or two more questions and then give you all okay, time, just good. for the sake of time? So there and then Harry. Uh, hi, my name is uh, JP Diaz. I used to be uh, UAW local 2110. Uh, initial agitator for the union that ended up uh, coming to formation at the shed at Hudson Yards and Art Museum slash shopping mall, I guess. Um, but <laughs> oh, depends who you are. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so I just had a question about sort of like sort of the fragmentation that exists within a lot of informal economies that I think are very representative of the workforce within the 21st century and that go and that is very is varying from from you know seamless drivers uh, you know food service workers who are often 
um, here undocumented, forever having sort of the looming threat of deportation, to sex workers who face some of the most malicious uh, forms of police violence, um, and how those economies in themselves, while informal, informal, necessitate, from what I gather what you guys have been talking about, the same amount of labor power. And I wonder, I don't want to say that it's, you know, underreported or underwritten about because I haven't delved too much into it quite yet. But I wonder if there is a particular framework that needs to be developed or if it exists, but a framework that these workers in themselves can utilize in order to build the labor power to develop their own strategies that are very specific to their fields of work. And this may go to further into just how, at, as of now, we struggle as looking at that as actual labor. Um, so I wonder if there's, if, if what, if the framework, the popular framework now within the labor struggle is not, in a sense, antiquated, and if it is, and, how, and if it is, how do we go about updating it to reflect this new mode of work that we see prevalent today? Great. Let's take one more and then put it back to you all, and then we'll do another round. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Cody. I'm a former Amazon warehouse worker, now an organizer at a worker center that focuses on beverage and food production. And I wanted to ask y'all about how choke points relate to uh, redundancy in a network, which is, of course, a massive challenge at Amazon. You know, the vision you just mentioned, Gene, you know, what if you could shut down all the delivery stations in New York? Yeah, uh, I used to work and organize with Ira and, you know, still working on it. I left, but it's damn hard. It's Did really, you? really hard because Amazon. I forgot Amazon to say that part. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, in case you didn't know, it's it's. I'm sure it's in my yeah, room somewhere. Damn hard. And I see the same thing in the brewing and baking industries, where you know, even if you organize a group of brewers, they can bring in contract brewing. If you organize a group of bakers, uh, you can still have apparently owner solidarity from other bakeries that will allow you to still get your bread out on time. And so, of course, the answer is broadly just more organizing. You got to, you know, organize all the other shops and whatnot. But when you're talking about choke points, what do you do in these cases of redundancy when you can organize a damn good strike and still have the impact kind of undermined by the just massive levels of, uh, yeah, power and money that these bosses typically have control over. Thank you. Well, so some easy questions uh, for yeah. you all to address in any order you want to start. Well, maybe I'll, are we going to close out now? No, I think we'll have, we might have oh, time okay. for a couple well, more. Well, I'll let, uh, go ahead, Gene. Well, I have an interesting example in terms of the uh, bakery industry. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I think in general, you know, some of the questions here about how do we transform the labor movement into a militant working class organization, and I think that's on page 11. No. <laughs> but, <clears throat> and that's, that's a discussion, you know, beyond the realm of this book, you know, but it's the right discussion. I think the book raises the question of how do you make sure we can do all these wonderful things. <clears throat> but I, I was called to... Uh, uh, to help with a, uh, a, a group of bakery workers. I were in a big bakery. They, they baked uh, all kinds of baked goods for one of the big uh, grocery chains. This was in Ohio. <coughs> and this was maybe 500 workers, you know. <coughs> they had a contract coming up. Uh, they were afraid they couldn't strike. Uh, and um, they were, uh, they, but, you know, the company was messing with them. <clears throat> so uh, they brought a whole group of their activists and stewards and all. <clears throat> and uh, this is sort of like, if you think of Pablo Freire, uh, people don't know him. His idea was you get people to talk about their life and they will teach you and teach each other, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so I've never, I don't know nothing, knew nothing about bakery factories, you know. I couldn't tell you three things about them. I like the products when they come out. But <clears throat> so we sat in a circle, uh, and I asked everybody what they did. 
I asked them what one of their biggest gripes are, and they talked about how all these new managers coming in from Harvard Business School, they have no idea what they're doing. If we ever listened to them, things would be really messed up. You know, the only way, way the factory works is because we know what to do. I said, that's it, can we go back to that point? I said, how many people agree? We went around and I said, well, well, let's talk about what would happen if you listened to them. I mean, you don't want to disobey the boss, you know? <clears throat> and so we walked through this whole thing. You know, literally, these guys are giving them recipes that were five years old. If you go by that recipe, the whole product would be ruined. <clears throat> uh, and so we came up with this plan about how it was essentially work the rule. It didn't require everybody, mm -hmm. but it required uh, enough people that uh, all they had to do was follow, you know, this is what they told me to do. Uh, and so uh, that was, the, that was the, the strategy. And it started doing it. I don't know for sure how well the union followed through <clears throat> because there was a lot of agreement. There was a lot of power. They started doing it. But you can't, uh, this is really tough stuff just like sort of any coordinated activity. You gotta do your homework, you gotta work closely with people, gotta deal with their fears, you gotta stay on top of it, you gotta follow up. Uh, but it was absolutely clear to me after a couple hours with these workers thinking about this together, that with 50 workers out of 500 just obeying the boss, they could, they could destroy the product and get a good contract. So, uh, but it was really just a matter of getting their thinking out there on how do you win. You know? Yeah, and that I think that goes to what I was thinking about the the sort of broader class consciousness raising, right? And like building solidarity and how do we do this? And you know, I approach this from the issue of our education system, which is very much set up to make us good factory workers, right? I mean, it's kind of the bell rings and we go and we sit and the bell rings and we go and we sit and take the information and we spit it back and we get a good check mark if we do it just like it was before we saw it, right? And and like that's the wrong model and that's capitalism and and we have to activate and be participatory in education and that means with ourselves and that means with our members or the people that we're organizing with and so um that was really what what i sort of write about and what i think about and and where i kind of come to this work and what your story reminds me of is it's really is deep listening and slow listening and i think we get, I was an organizer who got nervous and went in the room and like tried to do things, right? And like that didn't help. Like I had to just stop and listen and take a lot more time and understand people and, and really, and it was hard sometimes when I was there to teach because people would look at me like, if you're not the expert, what am I wasting my time here for, right? So they had to learn to trust me. It, it's a whole process. We have to undo this learning that we have about what it means to learn things. So. I'm good. You're good? Yeah. Knock up on all those things, all right? Well, <laughs> we'll I'm get gonna get to the, the topic of union that. reform I wanna get to, but I. <laughs> all right, we'll take a couple more questions yeah. and then maybe close out and also yeah. respond. So I know there were more hands. Oh, go ahead. I'm, I'm Mike Zweig. I helped organize AFT 2190 at the State University of New York 50 years ago. We got a union, and I'm still at it, and we're still negotiating a contract now. But I was thinking about choke points and to something that you just said about education. Within the labor movement, there are choke points, and race is a great big choke point mm -hmm. yes. inside the labor movement. And I just wonder how you all have experience in dealing with that. I know, Gene, you had stuff going on in North <coughs> Carolina. I'm sure that you all have a lot of experience with that. And I think that, that that choke point is something I'd like to understand a little bit better. Yeah, I, I, thought, I, thought we would take, I thought we would take one more question, okay, one that more hand question. in the back. Do you want to? There's. <laughs> thank you. Yep. Uh, hello. So I used to be an organizer for uh, the uh, mega local and real estate capital friend, uh, 32 BJ. And uh, <laughs> now I'm kind of like starting, you know, uh, to be a substitute teacher. So wish me luck. But uh, basically, my question it follows with. Uh, what a lot of folks here were saying, I just want to be a little bit sharper here too, 
is um, illegally, you know, we're on uh, increasingly more horrific terrain, uh, especially with like the rise of fascism, which I think has also taken a grip on a lot of the union workers in these strategic industries, right? And uh, in America, like union density is low, but also the most strategic industries tend to be unionized as well, like railways. So the question is, we're like getting in a position where legally it's becoming harder and harder to organize, um, and labor does need some sort of an offensive and a political response. What is preventing the labor unions and their leadership from like recognizing this historical moment as what it is and kind of launching that political offensive so that union members don't get, you know, lied to and like uh, absorbed by the fascist movement, you know? So that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, great question. So let's great go back question. to you all. Sure. Yeah. I think I think respond to the questions okay. thus far, and we'll probably have a few more okay. minutes to okay. wrap up. Well, a number of things. Um, I'm actually very hopeful about the political moment for labor. Polls show that we're, unions are viewed favorably by 65% of the population, particularly young people. We see three very dramatic reform movements within three of the major unions in this country. This is not going to happen without institutional power. And so we had the change in the Teamster leadership, which is leading now to a very militant stance going towards the expiration of the UPS contract on July 31st. This is an example of extreme structural power, but without associational power, the support of the public, a strike could be a disaster. But there are probably either going to walk or win by August 1st. That's very exciting, and that's a demonstration project to workers in logistics and in the broader uh, working class. The second moment is the United Auto Workers. This is amazing. You have a situation where a reform slate is going to take over the leadership of one of the most important and historic unions in this country. And what a challenge they face. They're going to negotiate with the big three. The contract expires by September 14th. They're going to have to put it together and deal with that. But if they do it successfully, and a lot of that is internal organizing, what Gene talked about uh, that we did with the railroad unions, are actually talking to the same people about internal organizing in the UAW. But I don't know if people know this, that there are 1.3 million auto workers in this country. UAW represents 300,000 of them. They don't work where we live, in Boston and LA and New York, but if you go down to South Carolina, you got a big time auto industry. And going to Walmart, if you can strike an auto parts company, you could shut down the whole auto industry. Look at that chip that wasn't coming and how it just stopped auto production. So if we think strategically about that industry and this new leadership aggressively moves to organize, we could see a renaissance in manufacturing. We are a manufacturing power of this country, second in the world. We are not a service economy hollowed out, whatever. Problem is we live in places where that's happened. New York, in 1955, south of 57th Street, there were half a million manufacturing workers in Manhattan. Small shops, garment, publishing, whatever. So that's the second. And then the UFCW, the union that Gene worked with, also has a new reform movement based in the largest local in the union, Seattle, Washington, Local 3000, led by a woman, young woman, and they are moving to try to change that union. That union is crucial to all these discussions around uh, you know, retail workers, food workers, sex workers. That's a union that could play a major role if it stopped being a business union. So this is a hopeful moment for labor. And the key is that the left go out and do what Ira's doing. 
which is get into a workplace and organize it. If it's non-union, if it's a union shop, change the union. So I, I, I'm thrilled about the moment. I'm too old to do a lot of this, but I could get a job at it at Amazon because they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> So those are my closing remarks. I don't oh, want to okay, take Oh, okay, great. Pardon me? Um, I'll just race. comment on the issue of, of, of race, <clears throat> racism and sexism. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I mean, I think people here realize that just the foundation of our nation is based fundamentally on the exploitation of people of color, indigenous people, black people, Latino people, every other kind of immigrant that's come ever since then. And every employer knows how to make those divisions in every place you've ever been in every way that you'll ever find it. Uh, and that in this, chap in this book, there's a chapter by Bill Fletcher uh, who has spent his life sort of educating unions uh, about understanding our own history of our own people. And by the way, the people who are members of your own union, including the white workers in your union need to understand their history and how they've lost out because of their inability to understand the power of solidarity with workers of color and so on. And Bill points out that, you know, the, the, not, the not to underestimate these Black Lives Matter movement, or immigrant rights movement, the Me Too women's movement, these are all people in motion and they all work somewhere. And we need to see workers as not just the people who are on the job, but people that live in the community and sort of figure out how to make that, those kind of movements part of our broader working class movement. And Bill has a good chapter. He could write 10 books on it, but uh, he, he sort of nails that at Womack, underestimated that. And I would just say, um, when I read that that piece, uh, I was reminded of sort of the, the, and he mentions this, the moment we sort of missed a real opportunity uh, after the sanitation worker strikes. And um, so then I looked back around to that and kind of the spaces that Miles Horton was holding at the Highlander Center, which is still doing great work and is doing work in exactly that now and has, has become a space of that. So. Um, so I love Peter's optimism uh, on that and, and sort of how we continue to, to build power and do that work um, because I think the optimism is necessary even in, in the face of true fascism. So. Great. Uh, the um, books are for sale, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so are there any other closing remarks, either Jean or Melissa, you want to make before we wrap this up? I'd like to say one quick thing, which is tell a little story, <coughs> which is, in some ways, <coughs> uh, that we're all talking about the fact that under this, in this capitalist nation where we live, our, our all class consciousness of the working class has been distorted in so many ways, including there's no, but none of us escape that, and racism is part of the sort of ruining our class consciousness and sexism and so on, <coughs> but. Uh, it, to the whole, and that most people in this country have never been a part of a collective fight on the job. That's like just never happened to people. You don't even think about that. But that, that is a really powerful effort. Even if it's five people walking into an office together on behalf of somebody, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy, but that's transformative to people. <clears throat> because <clears throat> what we've been taught as workers in this country is that, uh, that we need the boss, because I need my job, and I need him. <clears throat> and I like to tell this story about a banquet worker. <clears throat> and this banquet worker's job was to give out the bread and the butter at, uh, at these banquets. You know, these are these big things, and hotel workers uh, get this work. <clears throat> and this worker goes around, and he starts out at the head table, and he hands everybody a plate with a roll, and a, and a slab of butter on it. And he puts it out and starts to walk away and some young uh, 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 dressed up suit guy runs out to him and says, hey, 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 uh, Senator uh, Smith over there, he wants a second tab of butter. And the, and the waiter says, oh, I'm sorry, everybody gets one roll 
and one's one slice of butter. And this guy this is this young aide or something. But you have no ideas. That's Senator such and such. He's his this and he's that. And he's raving on and on. And the waiter just standing there. And at the end, he says, I heard him. He says, do you know who I am? The guy says, well, who are you? He says, I'm the guy that's in charge of the rolls and butter. And he walks away. <laughs> so it, that's the idea. We have to flip on the question. They need us. There's more of us than them. And once a worker begins to understand that, then you can take over. I can't think of a better way to end this panel than that story. So I want to thank all the panelists for their contributions, both here and in the book. I want to thank all of you for coming out on a cold evening. Also, everyone on the live stream. Um, we have the book for sale. And it, I, I really do encourage you to read through it and engage with actual debates in this book, which you know is a real refreshing thing. Um, thanks to the People's Forum as well for hosting this. And yeah, thank, uh, you, people. Yeah. thank you, Alex. And thank you, Alex. And I, I imagine don't think I it's worth anything, but we'll sign your book if that matters. <laughs> and Jean, thank you for being thank the mic you, passer. Jean Carroll. <laughs> sign. I want a signature. <laughs> sure. By where you uh, maybe on your where your article is. I don't know. What, what's the right way to do it? How'd you sign on? Pop it right in there.